Flames, it's time for Flames Unfiltered, your spot for Calgary Flames Hockey Talk. Filter hosted by myself, Brad Brood, and Kyle Lewis, and it is a hot summer July day, and it is free agency day, a day that was, Kyle, was it more than uneventful for the Flames? Yeah, but I think that's exactly what you want. Um, I agree. It is a busy, busy, very busy first day of free agency, but uh, not for Calgary. I was shocked, and and we're going to get into this more, but I was shocked, like, how much like there's no money out there and there was still just tons of stuff just going on people signing this i was crazy i couldn't i couldn't believe it oh good news uh Lucic is no longer a calgary flames fan <laughs> i was wondering out. what's the first thing we're going to talk about that, that's the, the yeah what do you think of peter lamartius being done as a color commentator uh you know that kind of i have a lot of fond memories of him um I think he did a fantastic job. Um, I love the way that he would announce uh, would announce goals. Like he just he had a great delivery. Uh, really good guy in the community. Very well liked. Very interactive on social media with the fan base as well. So uh, definitely a loss. And uh, I understand he's moving on to another opportunity. So best of luck to Peter and uh, what comes next. I, I liked him. I, I did. I, I liked him. He he had a, he had a different approach, you know. And and I don't think that was bad. I think that was good. And it, it was. Uh, he always had some good things to say. I always liked it though. And like some of the times he over explains stuff and I'd always start laughing, but, uh, uh, he, he was always very, very good. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Sad to see him go, but we'll see who we get. Uh, I, it's important. You know, you get, you know, anytime you have a play by play change or a color commentator change for the team you follow it, it it's different. It's, it's, it changes everything. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's hard to imagine, you know, going back over the years, like obviously Peter Marr being the most legendary of the bunch, but it's always, they're so consistent. It's such a part of watching a broadcast or listening to a broadcast. So it's always a, a major, major change. Like I can't imagine not having Rick Ball doing Flames games, for example, but I you know, couldn't imagine that will come. Yeah. In the day, you're right. The day will come. And I, you know, another guy that I would really hate to see go now would be Kelly Rudy. I, I have really grown to, <laughs> to him. and i know some people rip on him and don't like him and whatever and i don't know i just I, uh, that's I, all down to personal taste though i think i mean kelly rudy um my first exposure to him was was on the hockey night canada panel just after he retired for a number of years and i remember one year he attended flames training camp just as kind of a media spoof something to do like and it was really kind of cool like he kind of gave you behind the scenes look at training camp um but since he's come on board, I, I'm always excited when I hear he's going to be, you know, in the booth. Um, I think he does a fantastic job, and he's really coming to his own as a broadcaster over the years. And Kelly Rudy to me is is one of the more insightful, engaging people out there, and he makes a broadcast sound fun, right? Much like Rick Ball does, which is why they're such a great pair. And it's kind of—I don't know why listening to him is kind of calming, though. You know, to his voice is just kind of. I don't know. I, I enjoy listening to him and it's a good read too. You got to read his book. It's, it's really, uh, yeah, cool. actually his book is sitting, is sitting behind me here. It's, it's a fantastic read. It is. It's a good one. You know, this last, well, Ryan Pike summed it up really good. I don't know if you saw the tweet. He tweeted over the last 19 months and he listed like, I mean, I can go through it. it it's a barrage of, of bad things. And like the whole team got COVID the arena deal was dissolved, you know, it just a whole bunch of things, and it, it's really kind of sad to, to to look at all of it. <laughs> you know what? Now I just feel like with this new draft, we've got a coach, we've got a GM. It's almost like a, a full you know, Lucic is gone. Other things, you know, I, I feel like it's a full turning of the page almost. Yeah, for, absolutely. For the organization, yeah, and no, I know no. some people are upset about it about parts of it probably it's a happy what other parts and i don't, I don't know I, I don't have a lot of emotions whether i'm happy or sad or what i'm just looking at it as you know as much as we loved these players and we love the organ you know we loved everything about it and we love the hope that they gave us the last few years we didn't win with them so now turning the page and as may 
he struggles in the next couple of years. We don't know that really for sure. It's going to be tough to tell because some of the teams that, you know, sucked two years ago, got good really quick. And, and yep. I, I think this is a, a time to just kind of, you know, we don't need to hear about Gaudreau anymore. We don't need to hear about Sutter anymore. We don't need to hear about Kachuk anymore. We don't need to hear about any of this anymore. It's done. And now it's a fresh start. And I'm looking at it as a positive. I really am. It's a very, very fresh start. I mean, the biggest reset, I guess you can call it, that they've had in years, arguably, ever had, if you look at the history of the team. I mean, you've got a new GM, a new coach. Jerome McGinley's returned in a, in a special advisory capacity. Um, again, Mark Savard, former Flame, now is an assistant coach, a very offensive-minded coach at that. Uh, obviously, Ryan Oska is the head coach. So, like, the whole brass that's involved in the day-to-day of the team has either been supplemented or changed, which I think is fantastic. And I think when you talk about teams like you just did that improve so quickly, they do it by doing exactly what Craig Conroy said the Flames would do, which is to integrate younger players in the lineup. And as we saw today, those opportunities will likely be there for a lot of players because a number of Flames have left town. Another thing, Kyle, that seems weird is we used to seem like the offseason was just an off season and we, and we had time to like kind of push I don't want to say push aside hockey because many of us didn't want to, but it just seemed like there wasn't much there to, to talk about in the last couple of years. It's just been, it's a barrage from you go from right from the end of the season to the playoffs, to the draft, to the, or excuse me, the awards, the draft free agency. And it just, it cruises through before, you know, now we're at prospects camps next week and, and everything. And it just, it cruises through. Yeah. There's not time to get, you know, a, a break from hockey, which we all kind of need, even though we love it so much, but, uh, yeah, it, it just, it's crazy what this free agency changes everything. And it's going to be interesting to see what this team does this year as we, as we roll through an off season and, and get ready for September, when we come back with season five of the show, we still have some more episodes to get through in the summer, but September season five, it'll be me and you again, new graphics, a couple changes will take place. Um, some bigger, better things for next year ahead, but today on the show, man, we're jam packed. We have a ton, ton, ton of stuff to talk about. We're going to get right to it. We got draft free agency to Foley trade the UFAs Hannafin on the move when that's going to happen. And tons of little move, little news to talk about coaches. hire again, the back backland gets a Clancy hall of fame for Vernon. It is a jam packed edition of flames unfiltered. <laughs> Let's talk draft, Kyle. It's I, I'm I, and I and I'm I'm completely honest with everybody when I'm talking about prospects in the draft. I don't follow a ton of prospects, so I read my magazines. I do my little bit of research, but I, I mean, the guys we were drafting outside of the second round, I didn't have a take on them. So let's talk about how we thought the draft went down, and. Uh, and go from there. Uh, six picks for the Flames, and we picked big guys. What were your thoughts on the draft picks? <clears throat> Typical. I mean, for the Flames to pick big guys, but it was pretty much that was pretty common about the whole draft, though, wasn't it? Yeah, most certainly. I mean, it's but it's always been the case for Calgary. Although there was definitely more of an emphasis on on skill. Um, a little bit off the board in the first round. I I Did felt. You? Based on who was available, yeah, I was a little bit surprised by the pick, but I don't think it's a bad pick by any stretch. I, did, I thought, I'll like, if you like to look at rankings, though, and when I was following the draft, it seemed like the first round, there was a lot of off-the-board stuff. Well, I think because the draft is so deep. I mean, I think a lot of teams are looking at, you know, a lot more options than what they would have in other draft years. A lot of times it's maybe not obvious, but pretty clear between one, two players who's left in the board that you should take right outside of generally the top 10. Um, this one, I mean, it's, it's a deep, deep draft. And I thought, you know, overall I thought the flames did quite well. Yeah. It, I, 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 you know, it's one of those things. I always see these things. Well, who are the winners and the losers of the draft? I don't know. I'll check back in four years. I, I it, it's Yeah. That's so the only way to do it really. I, it's just so up in the air, but I, I thought all in all, it went pretty well. Um, Hansa, I mean, I watched some highlights and I'm, I'm impressed. 
yeah. I, I I feel like you know time time will tell, but I I feel like uh, like we'll be okay there. I did laugh a little bit when we when we got another goaltender this year and a goalie that left everybody in the media scrambling because nobody knew who he was. <laughs> yeah, it's not the first time they've done that though. I mean, I, you, to me, especially with how hit and miss goaltenders can be. I mean, look at Tyler Parsons. Highly toted draft pick a few years ago, and is, I don't think he's even playing hockey at this point, right? Um, Leland Irving to go further back. Oh, I remember. Wasn't he? He was. We were really high on him. Yeah, like John Gillies. Really, you know, John Gillies had a couple yeah. of really strong World Junior showings, and he was great at Providence. Yeah, and he's still a he's still a you know professional goaltender who's doing quite well. But you know, um, now we've got obviously got Dustin Wolf, who we've all got our hopes pinned on. Um, yeah, I mean, it's never a bad thing to draft a bunch of goalies because odds are a few of them are not going to pan out. No, no, it's yeah, it, it's a crapshoot when it comes to the goaltending. But uh, all in all, interesting draft. No trades, um, no excitement really a- at all at the draft, which is a little bit rare. I think they. Said- well, I had I had some excitement myself because the second round pick Etienne Morin plays for the Moncton Wildcats, so I've seen him play a bunch. Talk uh, about that. Yeah, well, Jacob Pelche, of course, was a Moncton Wildcat as well. Was our captain. So that was the most exciting draft pick for me personally that I've seen the Flames make. But Morin is uh, a really, really skilled defenseman, um, not unlike Jeremy Poirier. Um, so I'll be interested to see how that works out because obviously defensemen typically take a little bit longer to develop the defensive side of the game, which is what he's going to have to do to play pro hockey. But um, pretty pretty cool pick. I'm looking forward to the next season so I can watch him play some more in person. It, it, it's fun when you have that personal connection, though, isn't it? Because you know the ins and the outs of that of that player. Uh, yeah. I had a, a friend of mine and a, a kid who played hockey with my son get drafted 82nd overall by the Winnipeg Jets this year. And uh, Oh, that's cool. That's pretty close it, to home here too. Yeah, exactly. And so his uh, his mom is, is a Canadian too, and she lived fairly close to Winnipeg, and, and his dad farms uh, north of where I live, and it, it's close. It's close to Winnipeg. So they're really pumped that he's, that he's going to be a Jet and uh, – um, excitement there is, uh, the local kid, uh, it's picked 82nd overall. So that, that's always fun, fun to see when you have that connection. Yeah, absolutely. And, and again, you know, for all the talk, and there was actually, there was a lot of, a lot of talk about, uh, Sam Honzik, maybe not being, uh, the player the flames should have taken. Um, again, it's like a trade. You can't judge it the first day. I mean, obviously Honzik was high and was high in the draft for a reason, big guy skilled, but I just, I'm not going to judge that for at least one to two years at all to even guess how he's going to pan out because he could be one of the best players taken in the draft. We don't know. If you look at some of the, where, I mean, just take a look at some past drafts on your board. Just go back and look at the 19 or the, excuse me, the 2018 draft or the 2015. You'll be surprised on where some of the players were picked. I'm actually looking at the flames last few drafts right now. 17 wasn't bad because we had Valimaki and Adam Rzichka. Um, 18, oof, Martin Pospisil was the highest draft of flame. And, he, you know, he, they just re-signed him. But, I mean, I don't know that he's got an NHL future. And then, of course, 19, you had Pelche and Wolf for the two big names there. And then, you know, from there, there's a number of players who look to be probable NHLers. Um, but, yeah, that again, that was all. those guys? It was that yeah. long. Yeah, 2020 was Connor Zari and Jeremy Poirier, to name a few. Uh, 21, of course, was Carnado. Um, he's the only big name on that list. The William Strogren's got kind of an outside chance. 22, we had virtually no picks. Top Ironi at 59 out of just the three picks we had. Yeah, that's true. Uh, but yeah, 2023, 20, I mean, that's the most picks. Well, it's one of the like bigger drafts we've had in the last few years. Um, but yeah, who knows? I just, again, yeah, there's some players who would have liked to have taken, but we didn't, and we'll see how it pans out. Let's roll on into free agency. And today was, like we talked about earlier, extremely uneventful for the Flames. But it's hard to hard to do anything when you don't have any money. So, and maybe that is a blessing. I think it is. I mean, well, I, I say that. I mean, the reality is, is our, our last GM who did the same thing again today uh, with Toronto. You know, signing Ryan Reeves to a three-year deal, not a lot of money, but still, um, he always made a, a seemingly some kind of a splash on. NHL free agency and hasn't always worked out particularly well. So obviously Conroy's, you know, got his own ideas of how he wants to do things. And I think he did the smartest thing he could have done today. And the biggest news to the flames was all the guys that will no longer be wearing the flaming sea. So 
Trevor Lewis, which breaks my heart because, you know, I'm a Lewis. But uh, Trevor Lewis signs back in L.A. Uh, Troy Stetcher goes back to Arizona. That one was disappointing. I think we can That one was. was. I, I, you know, you, I always play around on cap friendly, and, and we're probably going to do that next week or in two weeks when we do the show is kind of just play around with it a little bit and, and pick some of our rosters that we think would be – uh, good with where we're at with the flames now, but I, I was just playing with it last week and I was pinning him in it. Like I'd give him two years at 1.2. And I think yeah. he got, what did he get? One point. He got 1.1 for one year. And I'm thinking crap, if we'd have given him two years, I liked the way he played last year. I, I did. And I thought he would be a, a good cheap defenseman. That's going to be safe, reliable, can give us some offense. I, I'm, I'm disappointed. We didn't resign him. Yeah, I am too. I mean, with Chillington back, it's interesting to see where Stetcher would have wound up in the lineup potentially. Um, but I also understand the appeal of going back to Arizona in terms of, you know, the climate um, <laughs> chief amongst other things, I suppose, but they've also got some good young players. So I, you know, sad to see him go, but it wasn't shocking. And then of course the other one, which had been reported probably a week ago was Milan Lucic returning to Boston, which as you said, at the outset of the show, you're, you're happy about, and realistically, I am too. I mean, I wish them all the best in Boston, and it's still amazing to me that Calgary won the Lucic and Hill trade by a landslide, but it was time to move on. You know, and in, in in defense of Lucic, part of his problem wasn't Lucic; it was how he was played. It was, it was usage, it, right? So I'm going to. You can say the same for Trevor Lewis well. as well. You know, a serviceable veteran that was probably playing over his head and being doled out there more than he should have been. Yeah, I mean, I got mad at Lucic, but I mean, Lucic wasn't jumping the bench against coach's orders to be on the power play with three minutes to go when you're down a goal, right? I mean, yeah, I'm mad at him for looking like he's got, you know, 30 pound cinders tied to his legs, but it's <laughs> that's who it is right now, right? And if he's not put in, if he's misrolled out there, that's not his fault. So, I will defend him in, in that aspect, but I did chuckle when I saw his contract today. It's a million dollars with signing or with not signing bonuses with incentive bonuses based off play. I'm thinking, what do you put on a bonus incentive for Milan Lucic? Like probably 10 goals, play so many games. You know what I mean? Like, I'm just like, yeah. what do you put on there? But I think there's, there's also, I've heard from a few Bruins fans and, and a bit uh, from those I don't know on Twitter that, Part of the play there is maybe to entice Bergeron or Krejci or both to return for another year. Um, it, so, but if that happens, they're, they're how are they going to do that with the cap? Well, it's hard to say at this point. I mean, well, they moved some money out. I mean, trading Taylor Hall, right? But um, they didn't they have a five? I believe it was a five million dollar cap penalty from bonuses last year. Well, you that's could be a, right. Yeah, that's a lot. I they guess the point million. the point being is that you're counting on these guys to come back cheaper because their play has regressed a bit. You're also yep potentially counting on like the flames likely are making a few moves for the end of the summer free up some space we're going to talk about that I, i'm interested to see how that goes uh free agency was interesting in the fact that some of the guys that went like Sor sorokin getting that term and that dollar to me just was a head scratcher even though i think he's one of the best goalies in the league but sure well, oh, i know when, oh it's not a ton yeah Carolina, they're all in, man. This team's all in. Yeah. The they Rangers just, are interesting today, too. Yeah. Um, just, Carolina just signed Bunting to a three-year deal. Yep. Wow. They are, um, what else did they do today? There was another move. Uh, that's going to drive me nuts. I Just real quick, uh, more recent signings. Eric Gustafson, former Flame, signed with the New York Rangers. Yeah, it was a, um, a one-year deal, correct? Yeah, and uh, one-time fan favorite, Big Save Dave, David Riddich, is off to Los Angeles, so he's back in the Pacific. Which did that David Riddich went to a Los Angeles? Yeah, he signed in L.A., and so did uh, Cam Talbot, actually. Yes, I did see so the Talbot. The old, yeah, so the Flames' former tandem is back together, come to think of it. Oh, jeez. Who else do they have in goaltending? They have Cal who do they have? They have somebody else in LA, don't they? Well, they had Corpus Salo. He signed with Ottawa. Yep, he's Ottawa. gone. Uh, obviously, Quick is gone, and he signed with the Rangers as well. Um, a lot of castoffs went to the Rangers, uh, Blake Wheeler being the most notable of them. That I use I, the word castoffs respectfully, you know, some buyouts involved, aging players, etc. Um I don't I don't hate that move though. Uh Phoenix Copley is the other goalie. Oh yeah, yep, that's the goalie I was thinking of. Yeah, you know, well, I don't you Cam Talbot's a good goalie. Oh, actually, sorry, not to interrupt that thought, but Connor Mackey also signed with the New York Rangers. Did he? Oh, jeez. I, I, yeah. uh, 
I've been going through these. I honestly, I didn't expect there'd be a, this many signings. I mean, there is a lot, a lot of signings today, and oh, it's been a ton, an absolute ton. Uh, and by it, the way, I agree with you about Tal. He's a good goaltender. Um, trying to see if there's any other any other notable ones. That's it for pretty much for Flames signings. But that was the that was the big thing. You know, just get back to the Flames for a minute on on that regard. They they stuck to their guns. They left. They let guys leave town that probably should have moved on. If for no other reason than it's hard to it's hard to really give young guys an opportunity when you have that many vets in the way. Now it also depends largely on coaching, as we know. Like I could have seen, you know, Lewis coming back and playing, you know, every so often, kind of being mentored to younger players. That wouldn't have bothered me. But, you know, they're sticking to their guns in terms of this team's gonna be faster and a bit younger. And if you look at the teams you mentioned earlier that, you know, become competitive so fast, that's how they do it. They integrate young players. And the Flames have a lot of high end talent. Potentially more than we think when we get talking about the more recent trade of Tyler DeFoley. Um, but the bottom half of the roster was slow and slogging. And, you know, it's nice to see that part of it change. I think, you know, and we can morph into this Toffoli trade now too, but I think we have high end talent. Mm -hmm. But I also think when you look at our roster, that we've miscast a few players as high end talent that aren't. Well, in some way, yeah, really can't I'm, sure. I'm really worried. I'm, and I'm okay. I'll cut to I'm, instead of beating around the bush on my comment there. I really worry about where we're going with Majapani and Dubé. Yep. I okay. really worry about that. I worry more about Dubé than I do Majapani. In what sense? I, I don't think he's there. I, I don't. I don't think we're going to get any more out of uh, Dylan Dubé than we're getting right now, and it's not that great. Do you think we're going to get? Do you think he's going to achieve that somewhere else potentially if he's traded? Is it just a matter of getting a fresh start? Or do you think he is what he is at the NHL level? I think he is what he is at the NHL level. Yeah. I, I think we watched it enough. Have we not watched it enough? I would say so. I mean, I had him, as you may recall, as my breakout candidate last year, and he did break out insofar as it seems like he's going to. He had a strong season. I think he's a player you can move up and down your lineup in a pinch, which is valuable, but he's not shown to be a 60, 70 point player. He's not. I mean, where Although he's been put in positions to do that, he just hasn't done it. He hasn't done it. And then we got Andrew Majapani, who we're paying five point eight million dollars to, and I like, honestly, like what Andrew Majapani brings to the team. Yep. But I, he, but the the fall off last year scares the hell out of me. It, well, let's yeah, it's not unusual though. And I mean, every flame the prior season overachieved to some extent or another. So, so I, well, he's he's so a guy. Is he, is, is he the, is he performing to the level that we can expect for the rest of his future and we just overpaid for him? Is that maybe what it is? Potentially. I think he's going to settle in as a 50, 60 point player and, you know, a valuable scoring winger, but not a superstar by any stretch. But I think he was one of those guys that really suffered in that second season under Sutter who with a more offensive minded coach, it really could come into his own. And that's why, mm -hmm. you know, again, we'll touch on the just briefly the hiring of Mark Savard as an assistant. I think that's a, a really, really smart move for a team that has skill, but we don't really know how much they have because I felt like it was suppressed a lot last season. I I or honestly I, I think that having a guy like Savard is gonna be a bonus for the Flames. Um I'm also I don't mind the Dan Lambert hire either. I, I, I think the coaching staff is rounded out fairly well were you surprised that LaBarbera was brought back as goaltending coach I was actually um that's such a hard one to read it is because he can't go stop him for him no no and I mean they were so successful the, the year prior right so successful so how do you I mean Markstrom was one off tying the season record for the Flames for shutouts he had nine Kippersoft's record was ten the prior record, I think, was Freddie Brathwaite with five. So that's not ins not insignificant. We'll show it to Freddie there. Kind of loved him. Um, but I don't know how to judge that. I mean, odds alone dictate that both those goaltenders should be much better next year. If Dustin Wolf plays any amount, he should be good as well. But if it was up to me, I I probably would have made a change to that position just because both of them were so too. bad. But I've been proven wrong many, many times before. So... Yeah, I don't know. Savard's going to run the power play. Looks like Lambert's going to run the penalty kill. Uh, one other coaching thing to touch on here: Mitch Love is gone as he joins the Washington Capitals staff as an assistant coach. 
And the part that I thought was interesting is he said in his, this is his quote, I had a couple of loose conversations with the Flames on the position there. I had interest in it. It just never quite materialized that way. Is this yeah. surprising to you? No. Based on the amount of success he had, uh, he was going to get an NHL gig somewhere. I don't. I'm a little surprised that he took an assistant gig somewhere else because I, I don't know how Calgary couldn't have found room for him on the bench. But at the same time, I think it's hard to go from so much experience with a guy like Daryl Sutter and Kirk Muller even, and then go to like Huska and Love, a really young professional hockey coaching duo. I mean, that, I think that's one of the reasons they brought in Mark Savard is they wanted somebody with NHL uh, pedigree, let's say. What well, were your thoughts on that? You, you were surprised he left? No, not at all. Not at all. I, I'm more surprised that he didn't end up on the Flames bench and probably more surprised that, and I'm only, I'm only hearing one side of the story here, and that's not fair to the organization, but I'm surprised that the talks were so limited, I guess. Well, we didn't get the impression from Ken Conroy that they were that limited until Mitch Love. I know. Before. That's no, why I'm wondering, like, did Mitch Love just, like, sugarcoat that to make himself? I, I don't know. It just seemed weird, didn't it? He, he made it sound like he got passed over rather quickly, and I don't know if that was the case. Um, to be fair, I don't think he could have made a better case for himself for that job, but neither could Ryan Huska. So, I agree. Uh, Mitch Love is going to be an NHL head coach, I think, much sooner than later. Um, but, again, it's the NHL. I mean, he had a lot of success with the Wranglers of the AHL, but we'll see how, you know, where, I guess where he goes from here. But it was disappointing because, I mean, he's he has fantastic rapport with his players, and I would have loved to have seen a – a guy like that on the Flames bench. I had I had a, a friend uh, telling me like that this is absurd. Like how can the Flames let him go like that? This is absurd. And I'm, I said to him, I'm like, relax, dude. I'm like, coaches get fired every freaking two years. Like I'm sure this isn't going to crush the franchise for the next decade. Well, it's not just that. I mean, look at any position in any job ever. Sometimes you can only go so far so quickly. And yeah. There's another opportunity that's better somewhere else, and that's you know. He probably had permission to go talk to other teams. Um, Washington probably made a really compelling case for why he should go there. And that's that's that. Or is that? Yeah. Yeah. Best of luck to him. Hopefully see him back in Calgary at some point. Yeah, we'll see what happens there. Uh Jerome McGinla, he comes on as uh <laughs> special advisor to the general manager. I don't have a whole lot to say on this. I love Jerome McGinla. I think he's a great player, I think he's a great human being. Um, I've never heard a negative thing about Jerome McGinley from anybody. I never, I never have. I, have you? I no, and you never will. I always think back to that story of the 2002 Olympics in Salt Lake City when he put those three guys up in the hotel because uh, they were sleeping in their car. You've heard that story, eh? I have, yeah, yeah. Like that's just the kind of person that he is. And the night that they retired his uh, his jersey at the Saddle Dome, he stayed till God knows what time to sign autographs for as many people as he could. Um, just a phenomenal human being, the best player in franchise history in my mind and a lot of people's minds. And I mean, I think it's smart to start him in a minor role like that because his name is the most important thing in the in this instance as he gets more experience. But it's kind of funny. It's like, you know, the management of this team is becoming the 2001 to 2003 Calgary Flames and Mark I know. Right, Joe McGinla. And I'm like, man, I don't want this to be the friggin' Edmonton Oilers reunion tour. I, no, I, but I, I do think it's a lot of guys who feel that there's maybe some unfinished business there, as, as they've said. Um, and, I, and I'm all for that. And I, you know what, you know what, most importantly, it is it's guys that love the city of Calgary. Yeah. I'm, I'm curious to hear Mark Savard talk more about it. Um, just because the way he left in my mind, yeah. anybody, anybody feel free to argue this with me and, and they will, especially with the Gilmore trade, the Mark Savard trade is the worst trade in flames history only because they got absolutely nothing for him. And then he became a superstar center everywhere else he played. Obviously the Gilmore trade was atrocious, but at least some usable assets came back. Yeah. Yeah, um, but it's interesting, and also let's not forget the circumstances. And I'll stop rambling about it. Savard asked to be moved out of town because he was couldn't get along with Greg Gilbert. They trade him. Two weeks later, they fire Gilbert. <laughs> that's right. That that's it is how it went down. So it? you got rid of the coach and you get rid of the player. What? Yep. Perfect. Anyway, way to go, Craig Button. <laughs> that was that was, uh, per- that was like that was. It reminds me of like remember when Vancouver had Luongo and and Corey Schneider. And Corey Schneider was like really like pushing. Oh them. yeah, that's right. And yeah. It, all of a sudden, it's like, well, shit. Now we have neither one of them. <laughs> yeah, they had. Then they had went with Ryan Miller, which is so interesting to think back on. Uh, it's anyway, crazy. 
Toffoli was traded to the New Jersey Devils. Um, your thoughts when this trade went down? I was surprised he was the first one. I thought Hannafin was not No, right? I wasn't. I, no, I wasn't. You know why? I felt he's easier to trade than Hannafin because the return for Hannafin, Hannafin, we expect to be bigger. Those trades are really, really hard to make right now. Really hard to make. Yeah, to Foley's, to I figured it was going to be a cut and dry thing. I, I figured mid roster player. And I actually thought a lower prospect than that. Or, excuse me, mid roster player. And I like a fifth rounder is what I thought we would get because oh, wow. here, and here's why. And that's no knock on to Foley, but the numbers I was hearing that he wanted and the term he was wanting, we can't do that. That's well. We can't do that. I find it interesting because one of the things he said, and, and again, you know, no disrespect to Foley. Um, I'm not going to miss his skating, though. He was not a great skater. No. But, and the team wants to get faster. But he said, you know, he was waiting for extension talks and none were happening. It's like, what the hell are you talking about? You still have a year left in your deal. Why do they have to yes. place right now? You're still yeah. contractually obligated to play for this team. So L- let me break some to you. I think Toffoli wanted out of here hell or high water. And I think he knew because he was told right away, maybe they did talk and he said he had the number six for a term and the team's like, here you go. I'm not doing six years at your age. That would be, that would be horrible business. And for once the flames didn't do that. Well, and that's, and that's the thing. And the other, the other side of this, the other interesting piece to me is that everybody was demoting the return. Tyler Toffoli's 73 point season, which I only remember the number because that's also his jersey number, was a bit of an outlier. He's a good scoring winger, always has been. He might score that many points if he's playing with Jack Hughes next year. There's Maybe. no way. There's no way. I don't I'd, I, be, I'd be surprised, but it's possible. No <laughs> but everybody's saying that, you know, they should have got more for him. Well, first of all, a third round pick may as well be a second round pick in a draft this deep. It's a yep. it's a decent pick. There's nothing wrong with that draft pick. And Sharon Govich has a fantastic shot. He's 25 years old. He's a good skater. Like, how can you not be pleased with that return? Never mind the fact that we're assuming this entire time that everybody's tweeting about it, talking about it, bitching about it. We're assuming we know what the market is for Tyler Toffoli. Well, we don't know. No. We have a sense of what it maybe we want it to be or what maybe we think it should be. But Craig Conroy get a decent return for a declining asset. On a player that seemed to want out of town from everything we heard. We got a guy now that is a shooter. He's got good size, skates well, can kill penalties according to everybody that's scouted him. I I I I look at his age. Man, you take DeFoley's one season out here that we just had in 21-22, Jaron Govich had more goals and more or excuse me, more goals and really close to the same amount of assists as uh or points. I don't well, know. But this is the other thing, and this is really interesting stuff that got passed around. So you mentioned he's a good penalty killer. Sharon Govich got virtually no power play time. And if you look at the five on five scoring rate for both players the last two seasons, they're damn close. Yes. They're damn close. So all of a sudden you give Sharon Govich power play time with, you know, Mackenzie Weger, Jonathan Huberto, Ukadri. Like you gotta think he's gonna be a fifty, maybe high end to seventy point player in the well, right we- circumstance. And then we get him for three point one million, which is not even close to the number we're going to get to Foley at, right? And he's faster and younger. So. And he's faster and younger. So isn't so this the what more, the fans wanted? So. This is what the fans wanted. <laughs> I love when you get worked up about this. Yeah, it, it's what we all wanted. It's exactly what the team needs. So my question to you then, now that we've we've kind of covered the Toffoli part. Do you think it was a mistake? that Hannafin wasn't traded before the draft in, in order to maybe move up in that draft or acquire another pick for that draft or whatever they might have done? Or do you think it's better to have hung on to him to see how the market is after free agency? No, I think it would have been ideal because I right. think our return that we're searching for is high draft picks, right? I mean, I don't know. That's I, I believe that's what it is because we can't, we need to, we need to move him to get cap space to just function. Yeah. So we can't take a whole bunch of roster players back. Well, here's the thing. There's not a lot of teams right now that can afford Hannafin. Nope. So, I mean, ideally, yes, I would have liked to trade him prior to the draft so we could add more picks in this draft. But you can't just give him away. 
No. Like, I don't care if we ride this out till trade deadline. I don't. I'd rather get the right deal. Yeah, I can't see it necessarily. I mean, I don't, so many things change over the summer. I think it'll be done by training camp. Um, I do too. Latest. But now, going off what free agent defensemen are getting today, oh, man. leads me to believe that the value of Hannafin just, just keeps going up and up and up, right? I, You know, this is kind of fun to talk about since he's our, our former GM. What the hell is Brad True Living doing? You see the John Klingberg contract? Yes, I believe that was one, one year, a 4.15 million. So you, you take that, you take the Reeves contract. I don't understand what he's trying to do with this team that fell flat in the second round of the playoffs. Now, Klingberg is good on the power play for sure. Reeves, you know, toughness and tangibles. I get that to a point. But I, if this is how he was going to work with the Flames, this is how he's going to tweak the roster, whatever he had in mind. I'm glad he's working somewhere else. I don't like these moves at all for Toronto. I'm I'm not really sure what he's what his thinking is. The what does John move, What does John Klingberg bring to the to the Leafs that they don't already have? I don't know. I mean, Justin Hall left, but the yeah, only other moves I th- that I thought were worse today were the Islanders and Lamarillo. I, well, yeah, they were just one after the other after the other. And there's a lot of names that moved around that I hadn't thought of. Like Brian Dumoulin went to Seattle. To replace Carson Susi, he went to Vancouver. I don't know what the hell they're doing in Vancouver either. What do you, what do you think of the Susi to Vancouver? I don't think it's a bad move. It's just everything else you're doing, I don't quite understand. Um, I even understand them for like five years. So I don't think anybody has, least of all them. <laughs> and they take Ian Cole. Well, he's young, thirty four year old. I guess <laughs> yeah. he only did it for a year though. So I mean, it's not. Oh, Laurent Brassard went back to Winnipeg. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I saw that. So did Colin. So did uh, Colin D'Elia, the former Blackhawks. So yeah, it's kind of it's kind of fun to yeah, do this. Did not tell this you thing. that Hellebuck's going to go? Well, if Hellebuck, yeah, I mean, well, but if Hellebuck's going to go, I'm I'm not sure I trust either one of those guys to get the job done. No, I, I no, I, I would agree. That's scary, but I mean, the goaltending market's kind of screwy right now too. I mean, Corpusalo went to Ottawa, Talbot went to L.A., uh, James Reimer went to Detroit. Mackenzie Blackwood went to San Jose. So there's that the goaltending carousel, right? So yep. as soon as the goalie leaves one team, they immediately sign a replacement. So were you surprised Vladar didn't go? You know what? He he might be a candidate to to flip to Winnipeg for something. I don't know. I, I'm not it shouldn't say I'm surprised only because I think well, first of all, Conroy talked about him today. Um he doesn't want to make it sound like he's actively shopping the player, but I think after you've let the dominoes fall and most of the free agent goaltenders have been signed or the ones that anybody really wants. Now it's like, okay, who didn't get a goalie that needs one? Well, guess what? We got one, right? Well, do you think that I don't, I, I think we start the season with him on the roster. I do. I know that's, that's a good chance. Popular. That's the right trick. Uh, it isn't, it isn't. I don't know that, but there's injuries too. A goalie gets hurt in summer training or in training camp. Um, the value could go up. There's no reason to move him yet, but if somebody calls and says, Hey, here's a, a blue chip prospect and a second round pick. I mean, I think you have to make that deal. Look what Carolina's doing with goaltending. And they're going to, they're running back with Anderson yeah, and I mean, they're going to have three of them again. Yeah. It's kind of strange, but I mean, it's also I, evidence you can have a really good team without having to spend, you know, Bobrovsky type money on a goaltender or carry yeah. price type money. I, it's, I, I like I like what they're doing with I love what Carolina's doing right now. I look at that, I'm like, wow, I, I love that. Did you see Tristan Jari what he got today? Holy cow. They just glossed over that actually. They signed Lar- the Penguins are busy too. Signed Lars Eller, Ryan Graves, uh, the old Detroit goalie, Alex Nedelkovich, I think you how you pronounce it. And yeah. I, th- I think I got that right for the first time ever. Nedelkovich, yeah, Trist- yeah. yeah. Tristan Jari, like that's I don't hate that cap hit, but what I'm wondering is with Nedelkovich and Jerry. What are they doing with Casey DeSmith? I, don't know. Goals, I guess, but anyway, there's, there's lots of goaltending questions to go around. Yeah. So back to the Ladera thing, there's opportunity every day to trade a guy like that. I just don't think they found the right one yet because they're not necessarily looking for it. No, I think they're going to eat. That's just something in their back pocket. Don't you think? I think Columbus would be a good fit for him. Yeah. I think Columbus would be a really good fit for him. Yeah. Yeah. So we got some free agents here are pending UFAs at the end of, this season that we got to figure out what we're going to do. Like what, what's going to happen with Lindholm? What's going to happen with Backlund? We talked a little bit about Hannafin. 
Tanev, Zadorov. I mean, the list goes on and on. Are we, are we cool? Are you cool starting the season with all of them or where, where are you, where are oh, words yeah. you've got telling you? Absolutely. At the trade deadline, you could be the, the most attractive team out there. You know, if you're not, so, you know, in a playoff spot convincingly at that point, it kind of reminds me of the 2015, uh, 14, 15 flames when tree living smartly traded Curtis Glenn cross the deadline, despite the fact the team was going to the playoffs, you get a decent return from Washington. This could be the same kind of thing, really. You could be in a playoff spot, and maybe there's the right trade for one of those guys. This is a lot of guys that we got to move at the dead. Like we, we're probably a playoff team with this roster. Are we? Well, maybe? We, we said that last year, right? Well, we're, yeah, we're supposed to be cup, we're supposed to be cup contenders. So we're a potential playoff team, though, with the roster we have right should, now. Yeah, it should be a playoff team, absolutely. But we'll we'll so, see. I just it's kind of scary. How do you trade all these guys? Heading, you you know you can do the Glenn Cross thing and trade one heading into the deadline, but you can't move four. And we can't trade if we're a playoff team. We can't trade Lindholm. No, heading, but I mean you also you can also give that that situation opportunity to kind of air itself out. I guess they made a ridiculous offer to him. I say ridiculous because the term of money for me was way too much for a player his age. What numbers are you hearing? It was an eight year deal, and it was post eight million in salary, I believe. Eight by eight, sixty-four, something like that. Okay, what's your drop dead number for Lindholm? Term or dollar or both? I'm guessing both. Oh. I'm not. I'm not going to take it easy on you. I'm. I'm not going past five years, and I'm not going above six and a half million. See, I, I'm. I'm willing to go more. Yeah. My. This is my top. This is my. Sorry, you're out the door. Number yeah. six years, eight million. And See, I, I can live with that. I don't realistically, he's not going to sign the deal. I just threw it there. We both know that. And uh, I look at that number. He's not signing that with us. He, he'll he get that from somebody. He'll get seven years and eight, five from somebody else. Oh, that's crazy. But the he thing won't. is, like, the market, and this is the thing about these types of deals. So whatever happens to Lindholm, whatever contract he signs, wherever he signs it, generally speaking, apart from some free agent idiocy that we see every year, the market is the market. And the problem we talked about before is that if Lindholm leaves under whatever circumstance, you're immediately looking for another Lindholm and nobody in the system, no Connors are a, nobody is ready to assume that responsibility at this point. Nope. So that's a really dangerous. If, if he's adamant by training camp, I'm not going to sign an extension. You do the best you can to keep that as quiet as you can, which in this day and age, I you know you really can't, but anyway, you try to mitigate the situation you trade him for whatever the best trade is, but hopefully they can come to terms with some kind of a deal. Cause they think he's a great player and he's still one of the players that the team needs. As far as Backlund goes, um what are you offering that, there oh freak that's a tough one it it's is a, a really it's hard such point. an emotional connection to that player he's been there for so damn long <sighs> at his age i don't know how you go beyond another three seasons four seasons but see he's going to want to stay long term or retire here if he's going to sign anything right in terms of dollar i mean you can't pay him more than he's making now because he's not going to be worth it I, I, with a number three years, five million, six in my head, but he's not signing that. No, that's what I would do. I, you can't go beyond three years of the player like that. Would you, would you, okay. I could see with a backland knowing that, okay. In here, here I'm going to, I'm going to something like backland's agent here. <laughs> so give me five, give me four. What, how old is backland right now? He is 30, backland, 34. Give me four years. Whew, that's pushing it. Give me four years at 4.5. Would you do it? Yeah, I would. I would, I would too. Four seasons goes by quickly. Um, and then he's our captain. Well, and the way he plays the game, it's not predicated on speed. He's a very smart player. He's hardly um, ever hurt. Yep. And he, but he's, you're not, aging's not going to, it's almost like Mark Giordano. Aging is going to catch him much later in his career. He's not going to score as much, but he's still going to be reliable. He will not be a liability on the ice. At least I can't see it. And he'll win faceoffs for you. Absolutely. And obviously, he's a great guy to have on your team because he just won the King Clancy Award. So there you go. So what do you do with Tanev? What do you offer him? You know what? The thing with Tanev is when they replaced TJ Brody with him that summer, I was like, oh, my God, this is such a bad deal. And I was dead wrong. Other than some of the injuries, particularly the one against Edmonton in the playoffs last year, or against Dallas, I should say, is when it first occurred. He has been so good for Calgary. I because, love him. Uh, I, I absolutely adore the guy, but because of the way he plays, 
because of how I expect him to age, I don't think he's a guy you bring back. I trade I, him. And I, I think it pains me to say that. Absolutely, but at the deadline, that is apart yeah. from the rare circ yeah, apart from the rare circumstance we're in some kind of a high scoring forward is available that you can maybe keep for longer term. There's nothing more desirable than a rock solid defenseman for a playoff bound team. He is the guy I save until deadline. Oh, hundred percent. He's, he's going to get a pick. Yeah. He he's, he's what everybody's looking for, for a stretch run. What was the trade? Um, was it Ben Sherratt to Florida that caught a first round pick? Yep. And pardon my French, but I was like, are you fucking kidding me? Are you yep. kidding me? If that's what he was worth at the time, Chris Tennant's worth a first and an A-level prospect. Yeah. That, we're not even talking if we're not talking about that. So where do we that, go? That's, win, that's a win now player. That's a win now player. Oh. Big Z. Well, I feel like he wants to sign here. I feel like he wants to re-sign here. He said he did. I the thing is, is, again, there's a bit of an emotional connection there. Not because he's a long-time flame, but because he's so fun to watch when he obliterates people. You hated him, though. Well, when he did it out of position, yeah. But no, when no, you have no, no, no. You, when we first got him, I remember talking to you, and oh, you, yeah. you, you, you were like, "Oh, Trainer, this is bad. This is well, it's good. too much money. It was too much money. Yeah. But I mean, again, the market's the market, and somebody else is going to pay him that, if not more. But um, <laughs> when he throws a huge hit to put himself out of position, and the opposition scores a goal, you just want to hang yourself or shoot him or something. But <laughs> but I don't want to take that out of his game though, because I, I think he brings that fear factor, and we talked about this on a previous show about how he brings the fear factor that nobody else on the team does. Wasn't that a terrible show? Yeah. <laughs> but you're right. But the other thing, like with him, like when you look back on the season highlights, you see biggest hits. And at the he's top there. 20, he's there 14 times. <laughs> and gosh, and he actually does have, even it's awkwardly looking, he does have some offensive talent too. He had so, six, was it 16 goals and nine assists or something? <laughs> Yeah, remember when he walked that guy in the last game of the season? <laughs> uh, oh, my God. And he's what? a character. Like, I, I know some personal stories about him from a, a buddy of mine that used to work in the Sabres organization. And, and like, he he's a really likable player. And you know what? He's probably super excited to have another Russian on board in Sharon Govich. Yeah. What, so what, do you, what do you offer Zadorov? I don't know. Give him another two years at two and a half, maybe. Oh, he's not doing that. He's making three, seven, five now. He's not going backwards. He's scoring more points now. He's going to want four point eight. Oh, nope, 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 nope. Look nope. at the rest. Look at the rest of the defensemen are getting right now. Oh, it's wild. He was. He would definitely, definitely get a decent return. How old is Zadorov now? He's only, he's only twenty eight. So yeah, yeah. Four. Sorry, fourteen goals and seven to six. He was a plus ten on a shitty Flames team. That's, <laughs> I know. It's those fourteen goals, man. He's, he's <laughs> he right. Now. He's probably wanting six point two five now. Oh God, you're gonna make me sick. I'm not wrong. I bet. I'm you're not gonna... saying you were. I'm saying you're gonna make me sick. <laughs> so what oh. happens with Hannafin? What What are we getting for Hannafin? I've heard he's going to Pittsburgh. I've heard he's going to Florida. That's not happening now. I don't. Yeah. Well, I don't think Pittsburgh necessarily can either. That's. Uh, yeah. They They did a lot of moves today. Made a lot uh, of moves today, I should say. So all those are like. They drive to that. Is it those moves and everybody acquiring all these defensemen? Does that drive the value of Hannafin down? No, if anything, I think it might drive it up because he's one of the most attractive ones out there. And the teams are, that struck out on getting the player they wanted or may have wanted as a plan B in free agency, they, they go back and they look again at what it takes to acquire Hannafin. Can we get a scoring right winger for him and forget about prospects and get a scoring right winger? Or am I talking silly talk right now? This whole podcast is silly talk. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I think you can, but my, my question to you is who would it be? Who's the team that could take know. on Hannafin's? Yeah, who, who could take him on? Well, no, they'd be, given, they'd be giving us a contract too for the top, a top line right winger. Because we bring to. Lindholm back, we got Huberto, Lindholm, and who as our first line? I, well, you're gonna, probably going to try Manjipani. He's uh, not a first line winger. We keep shoving Dubé and Majapani into places they don't fucking belong. Wow. Majapani, I think, is a better chance of fitting there, though, than others. I think Sharon Govich is an option. Maybe Jacob Pelche if he has a really strong camp. You know what I mean? Like, there's so much. Somebody's going to start there that we don't expect to start there. Freaking, we'd probably be better off with Coronado starting there. 
maybe we do. Maybe he has a huge camp. Maybe he, you know, lights out the preseason and ends up having a uh, 20, 25 goal season. He looks good in that game against San Jose. He's got a wicked I, shot. I, I agree. But if we're starting the season with a, a rookie on our first line, that scares the shit out of me. A lot of teams have done it. Wasn't Alex Tangay a rookie when he won the Cup of Colorado? I, I know. I know. I know. And I got to get past that hurdle in life. <laughs> but, but you got you to gotta understand what I'm saying, right? Oh, I agree. There's, there's no fit on this team currently where it's like, that's the guy who's going to be first right? Oh, first can line maybe a, can, can Hannaford trade maybe bring us one of those? Yeah, but you still haven't given me a fucking name. I don't know. I don't Somebody. know. I'll, I'll have a name <laughs> next show because I'm doing it. I'm making the trade on Cap Friendly next show. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna give it some thought too. There's definitely some younger players out there who have some scoring potential. Maybe had a 15, 20 goal season that you know you could get in a trade for Hannafin. I just scoring right wingers are hard to come by. They are. They 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 totally are. And I think we got one in Coronado, and we'll see. I I, I just well, I said I this before. Don't, I don't want to put too much pressure on him this year, though. No, but if he steps in and plays like he's potentially capable of hey, more power to him right um hell that's what we need we've been needing that forever well since the new hiree drew mcginla we haven't had a really strong right winger natural right winger well since lindholm played right wing and along with monahan and gaudreau really yeah um that's a really hard position to fill so what are we we'll gonna get from all over shillington this year exactly what we got out of Hannafin, but with maybe a little more offense, hopefully. You think he's there? Uh, I think he has a ton to prove, and he's going to be highly, highly motivated to prove it. I really do. And he had, he's excellent the last season he played. Excellent. He was. He was, but he was about ready to be the guy that went on waivers the seasons before. Well, he broke out, I think. I, I hope you're right. God, I pray you're right. We need that so bad, but then we got to sign him. We wasted a whole year of his contract at a good deal. We're getting hosed on that. Well, yeah, absolutely. And, that, and we talked about that before. That's not fair how that works. But yeah. I think in Shillington's case, if he's given the opportunity, if he's got, you know, maybe he gets top pairing minutes with Rasmus Anderson or something like this. A, well, potentially. There's a lot of ways this could play out. If he has a really strong season, I think the Flames leverage is, hey, listen, you had a great season. You took a season off. You came yeah. back and you had a great season. Like, But we need to see. And it's going to wind up being a bridge deal. The only way they can sign him if he has a big season is a bridge deal because I don't think they can afford to go long term with him. No, I but agree. I, I think he's going to have a really, really good year. I think he, him coming back, is kind of the X factor on that Flames blue line, and he's exactly what makes Noah Hannafin expendable. I agree. I agree. If we don't have Shillington, we trade Hannafin. We're looking for another Hannafin-ish player. No, and and I at least like I've always been a fan of Hannafin, but he does make me want to pull my hair out once in a while. But everybody yeah. does. But I think the return on him is going to be good. So like, let's leverage that. I think you know, like we talked about it a minute ago, ten of a deadline, perfect. We're gonna get an asset there, and like you just see how this plays out. But um, I'm glad we're not knee jerk reactioning. No, you know, and if they if they were doing that, you would have saw some kind of a signing today at two million dollars a year, leaving us at five hundred thousand in cap space. It would have been something dumb that doesn't need to happen, and that something dumb would have been, you know, potentially re-signing Trevor Lewis, Milan Lucic, somebody who they're intentionally moving on from. And Conroy said as much today, and I love the fact he's sticking to his guns. He's saying and doing the same things, yeah, um, because there are guys internally that can. And Walker Dewar is the best example I can give you. They can do those roles, provide a little bit more offense. They're better skaters, more to prove. Uh, yes. Yeah. He's Remaking a... the bottom six of this team could solve a ton of their problems, oh. plus having a coach with better deployment strategies. So Absolutely. I, I don't know what the Flames are at this point. They they should be a playoff team. Um, but you know, they've got a they've got a lot of assets. They've they've made some smart moves so far, including the moves they didn't make. Um, so we're gonna have we got a lot more to talk about this summer. Mike Vernon gets announced that he's going into the Hall of Fame in 2023. Um, Two-time Stanley Cup champ, five-time All-Star, Consmite Trophy. Um, heck, he's going to live on for all of us as, as the guy that was the goalie when we won the Cup. But is he really a Hall of Famer? Well, it's always and it's, looking. And I'm not knocking him. I'm knocking the selection process. Like, I'm not knocking him. 100%. So... The way I look at it is 
almost like the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. It gets watered down over time, right? Um, they just keep put every year they want to put like it blows my mind. Alex McGillney isn't in there, for example. I think he's a guy yeah. that should be, but they're always every so many years of eligibility, somebody makes it in. And I was always kind of on the fence about Mike Vernon, but when you listen to other goaltenders, his biggest rivals, Patrick Waugh and Grant Fear, talk about him, there's no doubt in their minds to the Hall of Fame goaltender because he was a big game goaltender, right? Yeah. So, won. and then and Scotty Bowman saying, you know, Mike Vernon was the goalie we needed to win that cup in 97. Yeah. He outdueled more than once the best goalies of his generation and some of the best goaltenders of all time. So, if you look at it like that, why wouldn't he be in the Hall of Fame, right? No, I, I know there's there's arguments, and I'm not like I always, you know, he's he right, he is that guy, that big game guy that you can depend on. I just, I don't know. I mean, I I think Mika Kiprasov's a better goalie than hundred percent. Kiprasov's the best goaltender the Flames ever had. <laughs> he won't even get a sniff at the Hall of Fame. No, but Ver and Vernon had the benefit of having some stacked teams in front of him, both in Absolutely. Detroit. Absolutely. And in Calgary. I mean, he showed well in Florida and San Jose in his latter years. Uh, not so much a second run in Calgary, but as a kid, I loved having him around. Like, uh, I mean, I get ripped on this for all the time. I've said this many times on podcasts, and I get ripped every time I say it, but I'll say it again. You take Martin Brodeur and you take him off that devil's system and that devil's team, he's not who, nope. He's not a living legend that he is now. Not at all. Great goaltender, but no. I don't, think, I, I don't think he's any better than Ed Belfour. Nope. I don't think I don't think he's anywhere near as good as Dominic Hasek. I could say uh, that Ed Belfour. Yeah, heck, I had a friend ask me a couple weeks ago, who's the best goalie you've watched live? That's a great question. And you know who I said? I know lots and, of names you didn't say. Was it Ed Belfour? No. Well, I almost said Ed Belfour. Uh, because I've always loved Ed Belfour. He played college hockey in North Dakota and I I he won us a national championship. He's just a stud. But you know, I said, the, like, I just, and I'm not a goalie guy, so I don't know everything, but just watching them live, I thought Nikolai Hobbybulin was the best goalie I watched live. His, his lateral movement was nuts. Now, this um, is a guy who at one point in his career pounded coffee and cigarettes during intermissions. Pounded them. But see, he's another one that he's kind of like, like Eric Lindros. Lindros had like those two, three seasons where he was otherworldly. <laughs> And injuries yeah. and all that. Like he was the most dominant player on the planet for a very short amount of time. Yeah. Happy Bulin from 2000. Like he had that contract dispute in Phoenix. Yeah. And then he went, we went off, went off with Tampa Bay and then he bounced around with the Blackhawks and the Oilers. And so he was, his best years were, there wasn't too many of them, but when he was on, man, he was good. Well, he was really good initially in Winnipeg. And then obviously in yeah. Tampa when he won the cup, Yeah, I mean, I, he just, I don't know, just lo just looking live, you know, like who is the best? I, we're getting way off topic, but who gets a crown? Who is the best player you watched live? Goaltender or player? No, player. Player. Oh, Connor McDavid, for sure. Um, that was during the, the, the playoffs last year, uh, 2022. So, but that's kind of an easy one because I've seen McDavid play. I've also seen Austin Matthews play. Um, you know who I really thought live just really stood out to me was Joe Sackick, and you're going to laugh at this one, but if you went back and watched some videos of him through the neutral zone, watching Marion Gabrick through the neutral zone, I was always like, oh. Uh, I saw Gabrick play years yeah. ago, yeah, yeah, when he's with the Wild. His stride, I was just like, he just was one of those guys, you know, sitting like 10 rows behind the bench, I'm just watching this guy, I'm like, wow, like look at him go through the neutral zone, like it. And Joe Sackick has always really stuck out to me too as a guy like, well, watching live looked even better than he did on TV. Yeah. Yeah. It's you know? incredible. But the best wrist shot of all time. Yeah. I, there's, yeah. It's, it's just different watching live than it is on TV sometimes. Oh, big time. I mean, the, the you know, back to the goaltending thing, like watching Kippersoff play live was, was a real treat. I saw him play a number of times. So uh, and he's the only goaltender I ever was fortunate enough to watch live who really, really stood out. Um, yeah, this geez, we're going way back now, but yeah, that's a that's a great question though. I like that a lot. It's it's interesting when you get asked those, and I don't know why that stuck in my head and why I even brought it up on the show today. But I was just thinking about Vernon and 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 it's I, I love like I've been to the Hockey Hall of Fame twice, and I the first time I went, uh, the people I was with like I thought they were going to like kill me because 
I, they were like, Hey, at the rate we're going through this building, we're going to be here for like three days. Yeah. And I mean, I just go through and I just read and just look at everything. And it just, it, it, I love history stuff and hockey history. And, um, I just sometimes think that the hockey hall of fame has gotten to be the hall of really good and not the that's, all, that's, any, that's any hall, I think. Oh, it's, you know what? Every sport, every sport is like that. And yeah. I, I don't know. I just, I don't know. I, I think Vernon was great. I love it. He was, he won us a cup. He did everything. And uh, yeah. I, it's, I kind of, it's kind of like actually the WWE hall of fame wrestling. Like if you were a part of the golden age wrestling in the eighties, you're probably in the hall of fame. If you were Rick rude, Jake Roberts, Ray trailer, the big boss man, like you're, it's almost like an automatic in, and the, and the hockey hall of fame is kind of similar in that. Yeah. Like, like you said, if you're, if you're really good and that was generally across his career, that was Mike Vernon. He was really good. Yeah. But he got in, he got in because when he had to be exceptional, he was, he was, he won the big games. I don't know. Yeah. And he fought Patrick Wall, which is just cool. <laughs> That's awesome. Wasn't it? Yeah. Oh, what do we have the rest of the summer? Well, we have uh, prospects camp starting in Calgary. I believe it starts this weekend. Uh, free agency is ongoing right now. I'm sure there'll be some more signings as the days go on. Uh, preseason gets going in. When does that actually get going? September. What are the date did I see on that? September 24th. We go with preseason. The schedule is out for this year for battle of Alberta. As I see. Um, we open on the 11th of October against Winnipeg, uh, at home. So that's good. Um, some road trips I see this year that, uh, I don't know. The, the schedule to me didn't look as bad as last year's. We didn't have some of the weird glitches like we had in the schedule last year. It seems like. Yeah, no, kidding, eh? no it's, it looks a little bit more, uh, normal, if you will. The longest road trip is a five gamer in October, Pittsburgh, Washington, Buffalo, Columbus, and Detroit. I'll probably uh, be on that road trip. I'm thinking I'll probably do Buffalo and Columbus. Are you? Well, yeah. Columbus is a beautiful city. I'd like to get back there and, uh, you know, meet up with some friends, potentially the Gaudreau family again. And, um, a buddy of mine still works for the team. So I've got access to the practice arena too, which is, which is really cool. That's but cool. anytime, yeah. Anytime you go to a game in the States, like it's so cheap to fly interstate. It's so easy to find a deal. I mean, if you're going to have for a game, once you've crossed that border, you may as well go to two. I always, when I go on trips, I try to at least get to two. It just doesn't make any sense not to, right? No. Yeah. Uh, eight back-to-backs, it looks like, this year. That's a lot. Better have good goaltending. Is it eight? Yeah, eight times this season. So that does bring us to that goaltending. We'll see what happens there, but uh, yeah, we're uh, cruising through the summer. We plan on doing another show July 12th ish. Um, if things break with big news, we're obviously, obviously going to hop on and, and do shows a, as we need. You can always check out our flames unfiltered shorts. Um, we'll fire off a few of those this summer um, to fill the flames news that happens. But uh I don't know, Kyle. Summer seems to be going quick, and before you know it, we'll be uh, back in the hockey rinks. Yeah, it's unbelievable. Eh? And I, I think it's fair to say if we see something big like a Hannafin trade, we'll we'll jump on sooner and later to a full show uh, if it happens in the next couple of weeks. It's uh, it's going to be interesting, man. I don't know where June went. I don't know where the whole spring went, honestly. Um, it seems yeah. like it goes faster and faster every single year, and uh, I, don't know. I don't know if that's good or bad, but... Um, it's nice to have hey, know, if it's a season like last year. It's a good thing. <laughs> it can't be. We're, we're, we turned the page, Kyle. We can't keep going referencing back to last year, right, bud? Uh, yeah, we'll full through. speed ahead. We'll get Always through do. it. Things, things are looking good. We'll see if there's some trades. We'll be back in a couple weeks to talk some more Flames hockey. Flames fans, enjoy your summer. And, Kyle, I hope that uh, you are relaxing and enjoying your summer. I'm trying to. Business time of year for me, but... Um... Yeah, I enjoy it. So, try to get to the beach here and there if it would stop friggin' raining. It looks like the sun's out now, so I'm going to go see it while I can. All right, Flames fans, have a good couple weeks, and we'll be back to talk more Flames hockey later on in July. <laughs>it connected flames unfiltered can be found on twitter at flame unfiltered check out the facebook page at flames unfiltered 
Host Brad Brood is on Twitter at Brad Brood, and host Kyle Lewis is on Twitter at Van Lewis14. Like what you hear? Rate, review, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts. Flames Unfiltered can be found on all the major podcast players. Want to watch the show? You got it. Check out Inside Edge Hockey Media Group for every show. Subscribe while you watch. Thanks for listening, watching, and interacting. Enjoy the hockey action. We call it playoff! Yeah, baby! Playoff! Yeah, baby! Thanks for tuning in to Flames Unfiltered. Check back for more action-packed Calgary Flames talk. This episode of Flames Unfiltered was copyrighted and produced by Inside Edge Hockey Media Group.